Thank you, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here and talking about the next set of stuff that I'm working. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's a, this is a joint work with, uh, uh, you know, so this is a series of work that I've been working since early 2016. Uh, we have been trying to use sparsity to make deep learning uh, efficient and scalable. And this work is like a culmination of work over the years with uh, my PhD students, and some of them are also undergraduates at Rice. And uh, one of the things that I can tell you is uh, I haven't found as smart coders as these guys ever. So you can find that kind of talent if you're looking at, you know, like undergraduates at Rice. So it's, it's, it's quite a fun to work with them. So, uh, okay, that's not doing the transition. One sec. Maybe I'll just do this. Okay. All right. So I'll start with this. There was uh, this article uh, which came out recently in IEEE Spectrum, and the title of the article was Deep Learning's Diminishing Returns. And what uh, that article was talking about was the current trend in deep learning, which is about increasing the model size and data, and what are the consequences in terms of energy and infrastructure. So this was a, uh, this was a plot that is for uh, an object detection uh, model. And this has been extrapolated, and obviously it takes the data prior to 2020, and it is extrapolated to reach about like a 5% error, which is what is expected to go as we reach about like, you know, in, in the next few years. And it also highlights the amount of energy needed to get down to those accuracy. So right now we are in a like, and the energy was measured in terms of CO2 generated. So we are more or less uh, you know, using a model that when you train it, it takes uh, CO2 generated by average US citizens in a lifetime, and by the time we'll be in the 5% accuracy regime, and uh, mind you, we are already less than 10% right now. So, but this is, this is where we want to go, and by the time we reach here, we'll be generating CO2 equivalent to the, New York, the carbon footprint of New York City in one month. So, and again, like this was basically trans everything was translated in terms of energy. The moral of the story is to get down accuracy with what the current trend is, we need to double, triple compute every few months. And, and, and that is probably the, uh, you know, the way to get around this because you need more data, you need bigger billion of parameters model. And this is being like on the x-axis, what you're seeing is computations, which is in terms of the floating point operations of flops. Uh, and the statement, this is actually coming from the same article, to half the error rate, you can expect to need more than 500 times the computational resources. So going from 10% to, uh, uh, to about like 5%, that's, that's, that's the, that's the bad, uh, you know, that's the cost. Now, no wonder, uh, you know, AI is showing a lot of promise. So the current trend is, uh, you know, it's very clear. We need like specialized hardwares with lots and lots of parallelism in it because we need, uh, you know, we need to do the same operations on lots of data, which we have realized over the past decade that, well, there is a way to get around this using, uh, you know, like massive cores, uh, you know, hardware. Uh, another thing that once the, once the models start becoming bigger and bigger, you cannot fit those models on one of the machines. So you need to start communicating with each other and your communication has to be very fast. So there is a significant investment in super fast and connect like N NVLink and all. And essentially what this is translating into is to reduce AI accuracy, get to bigger model, more computations, and get you know uh, expensive hardware and expensive interconnect. So basically, if you want good AI, you spend dollars. And these days with global chip shortage, just wait for their delivery. But well, I mean, it's, it's more or less clear that this, this strategy is not going to be a sustainable solution for AI. Why? Because of, obviously, I mentioned chip shortage. There is an energy cost associated with AI. And also, what we are seeing is, you know, data resides on commodity clouds. So data is generated at our commodity computing clusters. And the typical, uh, you know, cycle looks like this. So I want to train a big AI. So I first pull out data from the source where it's generated and where it resides to an AI-ready hardware, then we train this 
AI model, we take the model from this AI ready hardware to the cloud or to the edge or to where we want to use it, deploy it there, and then hopefully that model does not require a lot of refreshing again and again. But that's not what the reality is because AI needs constant retraining. I know there are a lot of technologies out there which says that, oh, we can do it incrementally, but if you, if you see, you know, incremental update means you are losing accuracy. So the best way to use AI is to retrain, which is what is done in most of the industries, right? So most of the search industries and LP engines, they require constant retraining. And constant retraining means that you are in the cycle again and again. Pull out data from a, uh, uh, you know, from a uh, hard, uh, from an infrastructure which where the data is generated, send it to an AI-ready infrastructure, train a model, deploy, continue. The data movement cost itself is, is becoming a, a major burden. Now let's look at the other end. And this is something that I would like to highlight is, uh, is uh, even more interesting. So there, there is this article that came out, the cloud is booming, but so is the cloud waste. And they did an analysis which, in which it's realized that 76 of cloud computing resources are actually paid for, but they sit idle or are never used. And if you want to just run some back of envelope calculation, the wasted computing exceeds 17.6 billion USD in 2020. So these are the cloud resources that are paid for, but not used. So I'm talking about computing that is sitting there. So you paid for a, uh, a computer which is you're using for development, testing or something, after five, five o'clock it's sitting idle. But you have to pay for it because you need that instance. And that, that is estimated to be about 17.6 billion USD. And if you just do it per day, it's like 48 million USD every day. That's how much cloud is getting wasted. In contrast, if you just look at GPT-3, which is like the you know, flavor of the time, everybody's talking about it, the cost of GPT-3 training is around 12 million. So you could actually, with this wasted cloud, train four GPT-3s daily from scratch. Now, what are these waste? What are these waste resources? Obviously, these are uh, you know, virtual machines and instances that are being paid for, but not actually used 24 cross 7. These are non-production resources used for development, staging, testing, and uh, quality assurance. About 44% of their compute spend in on non-production resources, and most non-production resources are only used during the 40-hour work week and do not need run, to run 24 cross 7. So there is an enormous amount of compute that is going waste every day. So here is a wish list. Can we recycle this enormous amount of compute that is going waste to train a heavyweight AI. So imagine this, that everybody signs up at 5 p.m. from their work, go back to home, sleep, come back to office at 7 a.m. and a language model is refreshed by that time. So you are now getting better new AI for whatever new data came in and you can work from there, right? And this can happen every day because there is a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, of idle cloud resources. And this I will call is essentially a free AI, right? I mean, if, if we can enable this, we are solving the problem of energy, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like all that plot that is going to burn CO2 equivalent to a, a New York City's, uh, you know, CO2 footprint for a month. We, we could save all that if we can utilize this. However, that's not easy. Right? I mean, obviously, I mean, why, why are people not doing it? I think it's also against the trend. Right? So I showed you a trend in which people are saying, AI, okay, AI is a very heavy compute, and to make AI work, we need like bulky hardwares and very extremely fast bandwidths. Now, these, the wasted cloud that we are looking at is on the other extreme, in which these are like small VMs that are few cores, like four to 16 cores, had about eight to 10 gigs of memory, but there are hundreds of thousands of them available. Okay? 
they have a small main memory available so you need to shard your model you cannot expect like a, you know any vm or any resource to provide you enough memory to do a lot of computation and in fact there is not even enough lot of computation there the hardest part is this it has a very low bandwidth communication we are not looking at something like nvlink which like talks at terabits per second we are talking about something which is even less than 1 gigabits per second so communication and communication now is a deal breaker for ai because ai has been going into hpc flops we where we know compute is kind of free communication is very costly and communication is prohibitive so we are we are focusing on very high bandwidth communication and this is the other spectrum and so we need some breakthrough here as in we cannot use the existing ai infrastructure that is there if at all we want to leverage this wasted cloud now before we go uh, before i go into and talk about what the solution is and sparsity is i just want to uh, get you th uh, through a quick uh, uh, you know like state of model parallelism so we realize that you you need model sharding because i mean the model is too big to fit on any machine and that happens anyway with larger models and in the in this case it will be required because your vms are not going to be that uh, that memory intensive right so what the reason why i say that we need very low uh, this is uh, you know deal breaker for ai training a low bandwidth communication is because of this so currently what happens is in, in the current state of model parallelism is that you shard your model which is a neural network on different machines and what do you do is you t again like the way how neural network works is you take the input you feed it to the neural network and then you compute activations and go forward so in this case you are you need to communicate all the communications uh, you need to com communicate all the computations that you have done on these machines to this machine because to compute this stuff here you need the output of this as well as this so you are essentially communicating a lot which essentially which means that if you if i give you one data sample your communica your communication is something of the order of the size of the network and if you are giving me one big batch of data the communication is of the order of the batch size the times the size of the network because every batch every data sample is uh, uh, you know gets you different activations uh, you know different errors so on and so forth so just to the back of the envelope calculation if you have about a million parameter model batch size of 100 and you are doing a thousand plus updates you are already doing a terabytes of transfer which is okay if you are on nvlink or something very fast but if you are on a low bandwidth this will kill you so we need actually a way around this so this is what the you know like this so hopefully the uh, you know like our goal is clear we want obviously a cheaper uh, you know infrastructure for training ai we want to utilize this wasted cloud and and this cloud that is already there but it's enormous in terms of uh, magnitude and uh, here is what i'm going to talk about next which is you know again going into little bit the technical aspects of what sparsity which is becoming a popular word these days for training and inference with neural networks uh, i will talk about the algorithm that i have been working for a while which uses sparsity uh, and we'll show you how you know we can get an, a, 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 some idea of how we can get exponential reduction in the flops then we'll show you how we can distribute this kind of an algorithm and actually get something real working on this uh, you know on the on a very low bandwidth cloud with lots of uh, with lots of uh, resources all right so the question is is ai really expensive and i you know i i want to say that this is it's about misleading flops so if we measure ai in terms of flops we are going to get misleading results now here is uh, by the way flop stands for floating point operations and it's pre, uh, it's a very common uh, it's a very common terminology in a high performance computing literature because we care about okay how many arithmetic operations are there and how much can i process but there is always a lot of conditions here i can process a lot of arithmetic operation if they are of a particular form not all arithmetic operations can be processed at the same speed so that's the distinction okay one sec okay so here is here is an illustration so let's say i have a neural network okay and it's about a billion parameter model so not not uncommon these days people can do 175 billion parameter model 1 billion parameter model neural networks are very easy to find 
and let's say the, it's partially trained, hasn't trained for about a week or something, and it makes some mistakes on a cat image. The question is, should I go ahead and update all the billion parameters? Now that seems clearly wasteful, right? Because what, what is going to happen is, if you look at the, uh, the magnitude of the updates, most of these updates would be minuscule. So of the billion parameters, there are going to be only few parameters where the update will have some magnitude. Most of the other magnitude will be very small. And quantization, if you're doing quantization, which is another popular term, it is in anyway going to ignore all of that, right? Because you're, you're doing 8-bit arithmetic or 2-bit arithmetic, you're doing make 0.00, you're anyway not playing on precision. So you, you will realize that that very small precision goes away. So you, you do all the, if you're doing all the work, but it's not getting reflected even in the model. But current hardware will do, do, do that work because it requires memory coalescing. And the way current model works is they will count all these operations as flops. So if I make a mistake on a CRAD, I'm supposed to update a billion parameter, so I'm doing a billion or more floating point operations. And I want the capability to do that faster. It's a different story that 99% of them doesn't matter. And to, you know, like, if you, want to, if you want to see the real, uh, you know, like impact of this, try this. So implement your random dropout. So I mean, dropout is a technique in which you randomly forget a, a fraction of the network. So take your favorite language, TensorFlow or PyTorch, okay, or, or whatever fr framework you're using, do 99% dropout or just 1% activation. Now we know that this is, you're throwing away 99% of the computations randomly. Don't worry about accuracy right now. Just throw away 99% of the computations randomly. And as these framework, you should be faster, right? I'm giving you 99% less flops. You'll be surprised to know that they are actually slower. So you can code this up. Dropouts of 1% is actually slower with no dropouts. For training, for inference, both. Why? Because the way they will do is they have only one hammer, which is matrix multiplication. And so they will take, do, first do matrix multiplication, hit that with a hammer, and then apply a mask. And the masking will make 99% of the computation zero, but that's the way they will do it. And so it's, you know, so zero is no ops. That's not true in this framework. So what this demonstrate is that counting AI in terms of flops is very misleading. For example, this, this is 99% less flop. It's going to be way more slower on your best, most optimized softwares. And AI does not need this, and this is what the whole world is going. I mean, we, we are going towards quantization. That means precision is not important. If precision is not important that much, why worry about it? Why compute all the work, then realize, oh, that's a small precision, let's ignore it, right? That is, that is why the sparsity is getting more traction. So here is a hope, which is about sparsity. And it's getting a lot of traction about, uh, you know, how do you, and, there, and different, there are different views of sparsity. I'll try to uh, summarize all them uh, later. But uh, basically, there is a TED talk by Jeff Dean, who is, uh, you know, the uh, senior, uh, you know, uh, senior fellow at Google, which is AI isn't as smart as you think, but it could be. And the sparsity is one of the primary next goals for future of AI. Now, I'll talk about what that sparsity means. Even Bill Daly's talk at ML says, uh, the directions of deep learning hardware, they are focusing on sparsity. So what is sparsity? At a high level, sparsity means somehow we can reduce the number of flops significantly by making significantly comp significant amount of the computation zero, which is precisely what we saw, more or less. Like, I mean, if the computation is z an update by 0 0.0001, why even compute the update? Right, I'm doing a lot of work to get what the update is going to look like for this parameter 0 0.0001. Oh, I don't need it, it's already quantized. Can I not do the computation? So why sparsity? So before we get into why sparsity is considered as one of the hopes for uh, the future of AI is because the models are not getting any smaller. So we have G shard, we have uh, you know GPT-3, then there was a Facebook reported 12 trillion parameter recommendation system models and people are already into trillions amount of parameters. Now why that is important is because there was this paper that argued that you need large model capacity to absorb the variations in the data. 
So if somebody comes to me and say, well, I can give you good accuracy with small model, that means there is not enough variation in the data. Simple. It's information theory. You assimilated all the information from the data into the model. Your model is nothing but a function. A function takes an input and maps it to an output. If there is a lot of variability in the function, the function description cannot be small. Model cannot be small. If you want this AI to do a lot of decision making, it, it got to be big. Now, there was another interesting paper uh, last year in Europe's. Is the number of trainable parameter all that actually matters? And in fact, this paper was eye-opening because they show you can change the architecture, you can do what you want, but it seems that the, if you change the number of tra trainable parameters, that's when you, you, you see a uh, you know, decrease in accuracy. So if you don't change the number of trainable parameters, architecture and all are like not that important. And again, like uh, talking about sparsity, we don't need all the computations for every input. If we are, uh, you know, like if we go around that, that well, I don't need, if I made a mistakes on CAD, I don't need a billion computations. I probably only need few thousands. If we go around that, then we don't see any reduction in the number of trainable parameters. Because any other approach will somehow argue that your model has to be small. Right, how do I get reduced flops? Well, prune it. Pruning means you're saying, a lot of parameters are not needed. But that means your model is small. That's not where the world is going. But sparsity does not enforce the model to be small because, well, for cats, I need parameter 5 and 6. For dogs, I need parameter 6 and 12. For buses, I need some other parameters. So I still need a lot of parameters. So my function description is big, which is indeed needed because my data is complex. But my flops are still low because I don't need all the parameters on every input. Oh. Never mind. Now, why sparsity could be a breakthrough for our use case is because you know, the communication, instead of being, so remember the slide where I showed you, the communication was of the order of the parameters. Now the communication could be of the order of the sparsity. Because if I am not utilizing all the activations and all the parameters, then I don't need to communicate. I only need to communicate what is needed. And for every sample that I'm feeding to the network, if I'm only using 1,000 parameters, my communication footprint is of the order of 1,000 rather than a million or a billion. So in a sense, if I, have a, if I can do something at 100 gigs bandwidth with 99% sparsity, I can do that with 1 gig bandwidth. The question is, can we achieve uh, something like 99% or more uh, reduction in flops? Now this is, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, before uh, I go and talk about the algorithm that I've been working on, I, I can quickly summarize the state of sparsity. The good is obviously we know we don't need all the flops. There is, that's the, where the hope of efficiency is. The bad part is we still are not sure, like given an input, how do we actually, there's not a lot of science of how do we actually decide which sparsity to use, right? I mean, given an input, how do I figure out what, like maybe only use a few parameters, how do I figure that out? And the ugly part is, if the sparsity is not static, which is likely the case, right? If my input is going to give me different parameters for every different input, which is what is needed, I lose all the advantage of hardware accelerators. More or less, right? Because, well, if I don't know what my structure of sparsity is, I cannot, leverage all the parallelism, like the flops are, that doesn't work. Like flops does not mean you give me any random set of operations and I'll make all of them faster. No, it's it's a very specific set of operations that I can make faster. So, I mean, uh, you know, like uh, there are enough evidences and I have talked about this in the past quite a while that, you know, uh, you know, given any input out of potentially several neurons, can I pick the right neurons beforehand and not compute something that are not needed? So imagine I have an image of a cat and I know the three dots in orange are the ones that are going to be having large activation. Other may be either ignored by ReLU or may have uh, you know, insignificant computation. Can I, uh, can I compute that efficiently beforehand? without even doing all the work, because the other way would be I compute all the activation and threshold. That's not, because you're doing a lot of work. So this is where uh, we, uh, we realize that it's more like a web search analogy, right? When you type a query on Google, Google has indexed the web 
in a way such that the query automatically maps to the right or relevant pages. And this is a similar problem, right? I want relevance. I want what parameters are relevant to the input. It's like a query model. Given the query as an input, like what I type on Google search, images or text, and I want to know what fraction or what part of my network is relevant to that input, it's an information retrieval problem. And we are going to do something very similar. We are going to create, we are going to index our neural network. Now that sounds a little scary because, well, neural networks are big and we are talking about matrix multiplication, now you're talking about indexing network, but well, that could be just a small one-time operation. So that is what happens here. So we, uh, you know, this is basically my works in 2016 to 17, 18, and there, are, there has been a lot of follow-up works where we, what we do is we realize that, well, if the network itself is big and I have a question of given an input, find the right sparsity pattern, we can treat this as an information retrieval problem or an approximate query processing. Now, given an input, the, the first thing would be I will pre-process my neural networks into data structures or hash tables, just like how Google will pre-process the web for querying. Then, given an input, I will query those data structures for relevant neurons. Now, I got a sparse activation. I do the same thing in the next layer. And so, just by few queries, I get the sparsity pattern of the, of the neural network. So this is the framework I'm going to follow. Instead of taking the input, showing it to the network and saying, okay, what are interesting uh, parameters? And the way to do that is I probe every parameter and ask the question, are you interesting? Are you interesting? Are you interesting? Are you interesting? And they say, no, 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 yes. Okay, then I keep that. That's a expensive process. The other process is I index the web and just by the relevance of the query, the query maps to the right memory location and say, okay, all, all, things lying here in this clusters are interesting, pick them up. That is what I'm going to do. So this way, as you can see, things that are not interesting, I'm not even touching them. I'm spending zero energy for anything that is not going to be relevant, at least in this computation flow. So zero is no operation. And then similarly, I, now I, all, I, all I have to do is to forward propagate my network and back propagate only on this subset of the parameters and the computations of, of the order of what the sparsity is. Uh, one interesting thing that comes up, remember, is when I talk about uh, you know, this random sparsity, it loses memory coalescing, right? Because I, don't, I have no idea, uh, you know, like I cannot determine beforehand what is going to be the sparsity pattern for the input because the input is dynamic. Just like your queries are dynamic when you type something on uh, your search engines. So your input is dynamic, you don't know what, uh, what you will get. So you cannot predetermine anything, you cannot really use those memory coalescing for HPC. But the other thing that you can use is what I think is even better, which is data parallel gradient descent. So imagine if I have a cat and a beer and they, they, they prefer a very different set of parameters, then I can update both of them in parallel. Now right now, the way gradient descent works is a sequence check. Because if I'm doing a dense computation, I have to first work on a mistake of the cat and let it go update the parameters because my prediction on the next depends on how I update the cat. But if they are picking different set of parameters, then I don't have to worry about this because cat parameters are disjoint or more or less disjoint than the beer parameters. And so I can feed forward them and update them in parallel. Now this actually scales better than your matrix multiplication computation because this is asynchronous parallelism. This it's like no uh, no communication. By the way, here is an here is an interesting thing. So uh, we bench, when we benchmarked this algorithm, that was about I think uh, 2016 or 27, uh, 2017 and 18. At that time, uh, TensorFlow was doing matrix multiplication as parallel, right? So if you give it a lot of core, it will still do matrix multiplication. And, the, and basically, the parallelism quickly saturates. Recently, we did the benchmarking. Obviously, we are still better, but TensorFlow now changed something. So if TensorFlow realizes you are giving me 64 cores, I will still do data parallel computations and then use few cores for matrix multiplication. So data parallelism actually scales much better because it's asynchronous. You give me 100 cores, I can use 100 cores. You give me 1,000 cores, I can use 1,000 cores. It's like it just scales. I'll show you some of the scaling behavior too. 
And this is what I call as brain-like efficiency. So if you, I mean, again, like uh, if you are into the, uh, you know, uh, the world of, uh, you know, neuroscience, there is this thing, something called sparse coding. So one of the anticipated, again, we still don't know why brain is so efficient, but people believe that one reason why brain is so efficient is what is known as spike neurons. So when I see some patterns, there are very few neurons that will spike on those patterns. And that's probably the picture on the right. So there are very few neurons that will spike, and that is how you will recognize the patterns. Whereas, if you look at how currently we are doing the computation, we still see the spike, but we compute all the activation. So if you look on the left, I'm just making everybody active and then asking the question, which one of you spiked? So I'm spending equal amount of energies on neurons that spike and neurons that don't spike. That's not how brain works, it seems. So I, and the reason why I call this close to brain-like sparsity is because neurons that are not spiking, I'm not even touching them. I am not touching no ops. Now, uh, you know, like before I go and start showing you some results, uh, there are many notions of sparsity at present. So we have to be careful about like which is what. The most popular notion of sparsity assumes fixed sparsity, as in you prune the network, you throw away a lot of parameters, and then you assume that your model is sparse. But that's not, that's getting obsolete because it implies that you have less parameters. Now, what is getting popular recently is what, uh, you know, like, okay, so there has been some mismatch here, but there is sparse tensor cores from, like, what they assume is that your network is something like 50 or 75% sparse, and when you give me a sparse matrix, I approximate the sparse matrix as a product of two small dense matrices using low rank approximation, and instead of doing sparse matrix computation, I'm going to, still going to do dense matrix computation, but this is pre-computed. So what I will do is, I will pick a whole bunch of these basis kernels, like I will say that what are all interesting sparsity patterns that I can observe? Let's, let's pre-compute an approximation of that sparse by dense. See, once you make a hammer and it works really well, you get addicted to it. The hammer that worked really well is matrix multiplication. Somebody comes and says, we want to do sparsity, matrix multiplication doesn't work, so what is the way around? Well, let's still use the hammer and approximate sparse with smaller dense. That's the idea here. So all this, uh, you know, thing about, you know, tensor core, structured sparsity, they all boils down to this picture here in which we take the sparse matrix and instead of doing a sparse matrix operation, I convert that into a small dense matrix operations. And well, I am back into my own, into my regime where I have you know, the supremacy because of that hammer, I will still do dense matrix multiplication. The problem is, it's not going to go beyond, like if you are only looking at 50, 75% sparsity, it's something like quantization. It will give you some constant factor improvement, won't scale. It's hard to tune to new network. So essentially, these model assumes that you tell me beforehand what your computation graph is, so that now I can design a redesign, rechange the basis to certain sparse kernels that I am comfortable with and give you that computation. It's something like, you know, a building a compiler for, for a specific kind of a network or a kind of a computer. Whereas the algorithm that I showed you, it's independent of your network. You give me any fully connected network, wide, small, and I can, you know, I can just, uh, you know, it's a plug and play. I mean, you just give me sparsity as a budget, how much sparsity you want, because it's an information retrieval algorithm. You want top 10, you want top 1,000, you want top 100, how many do you want? And you can plug and play with it. So it works at any budget. It, we routinely use 99.5% sparsity to train models, and we see same or even sometimes even better accuracy. The gain scales with the network and works for both training and inference. And I'll show you some numbers for both training and inference. But what I'm talking about is if somebody is arguing that, oh yeah, give me BERT model, and I'll make BERT model faster, it's that easy, because I know the whole computation graph. I can approximate it, beat it to death, and make it like 10x better. But tomorrow, BERT will be probably Robert, Colbert, I don't know what BERT it will be, right? I mean, you have seen there's all these GAN zoos, right? Models are evolving every year. Right? What was the best ImageNet model? I mean, LXNet, when was that? Now it's EfficientNet. So yeah, this is a great business because, but then every time you have to keep retuning, fine-tuning, and giving to a customer, next, next year it changes. 
What we want is a framework that you can build in your own network and see the result of sparsity. And you don't even have to tell what you're using. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm also part of this company, Third AI, where we are building this. And the way we are approaching this is you define your model just like you're defining it in TensorFlow, and you don't have to tell us what that model is. All you do is you do a plug and play a switch, switch the engine, and now it will train it with sparsity and be the model is available in the form that you want, could be in the same form for you to go and use it uh, in, your, in your pipeline. So here are some of the numbers. So what, what is one of the advantages of this? I mean, so uh, this is about uh, you know, a product recommendation task with a 200 million parameter model. On the left, you are seeing a few bar charts. I'm comparing on three processors, AMD, Intel, and ARM. One of the advantages of this is we are no more tied to any processors. We are using basic data parallelism. You give me any number of cores. I don't care if it's AMD cores, ARM core, whether you know, we are not using any vectorization. I mean, there are other results that I have about, like you can still improve it with vectorization if you want. But for now, it's a bare metal uh, C++ code that uses as many cores as you give it to it. And the comparison is with the TensorFlow implementation. The Intel one is optimized with one AI, AMD has its own, and then Apple, uh, you know, like, uh, again, like the TensorFlow optimized for that. I'm also showing for reference a GPU. And the blue line is basically the software implementation that I talked about, and it's the same code. It's just the same code compiled on different platform. Because it's algorithm only, it's software, plug and play. Now on, the, on, on this, what we are, so this is, on the left you are looking at time per epoch, as in time to process one full data set. On the right you are looking at how much wall clock time, something that people care about. I want to reach a particular accuracy, how much time it will take me. And that automatically translates into AWS cost. The blue line is on a CPU, which is the, uh, the Intel Xeon 800. And the, the gray line is a 800 GPU, and the orange line is the same CPU as the blue line. And if we are just talking about one metric, time to reach a particular accuracy. You're still faster. So when the question is, what is the time to reach a particular accuracy, and what is the cost to reach a particular accuracy? Models, algorithms, implementation, everything is on the open table. Why AlexNet? Why not EfficientNet? Why this net? I mean, you can ask any question. But what matters at the end of the day is how much I'm paying to reach this accuracy. And remember, the, 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 orange, the gray curve here is on GPU, so it's significantly expensive even for the same time. Uh, now, when you, when you train a 1.6 billion parameter model, you quickly go out of memory on GPUs because this is like you need bigger batch size, and we all know that GPUs are not very good with large model and large batch size. You probably need four A100 to train this model, but on a CPU, I can easily have 200 gig RAM, so I can train it on CPU. The, the problem is if I train it with a standard process, it's going to be very, very, very slow because it's a big model, whereas with sparsity, it can be even faster than four A100 GPUs. Now, the same acceleration works for inference. So this is some of the intent classification benchmarks with six million, one million parameters. We are comparing with Intel's OpenVINO. Uh, the Bolt engine is the sparsity engine. Then we are looking at TensorFlow, CPU, and GPU, and we are seeing both the training time and the inference time. Note that accelerators that builds better inference doesn't do training. An accelerator for training doesn't do inference. Right? And we are arguing that, well, it's a sp well, it's sparsity. I'm, I'm just changing the feed forward, so why not inference too? I could do inference too. And as you can see, the accuracy is intact. We are not making any compromises with accuracy. Coming back to the problem that we started with, using the wasted cloud, and I mentioned sparsity reduces the computation. This is just a rework of the slide that I showed you before is now if I have sparsity, I'm only activating, let's say, 1,000 neurons instead of a million for every input. I only have to com communicate 1,000 activations across the network. So we build this in MPI. We share neurons in a standard way. The computation is also very simple. The, you know, when you shard the network, every sharded part has its own hash table, right? And it's also like uh, independent across the partition. Every uh, local computation is like, okay, what are the interesting neurons local to you? Give me that, I'll compute the activation, I will cross, and then I'll move forward, right? Um, compute local activation, computer, we, we, we implemented this in MPI. 
There are certain details that we did about like ensuring load balancing, threat synchronization barrier, and that also can enable large batch size. I mean, uh, you're welcome to read the paper. But here is what we look at. So this is a sanity check experiment. So we are doing it on a cluster. We are looking just at the scaling behavior. Right now we are assuming we have 100 gigabytes bandwidth between the CPUs. Again, this is still smaller than NVLink. Uh, what I'm comparing is I'm just using two nodes, two CPU nodes, and seeing the uh, what is the overhead of distributed computation. The communication is going to be the overhead here. And so this uh, D slide on two nodes is which uses two CPUs, and I'm just comparing the comparable performance that I can get on different GPUs. So the, 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 only the distributed version of our code is using this 100 gig bandwidth. Other are using GPUs with NVLink. So V100, that's the time per epoch. And you can also see the scaling behavior. So as I increase the number of threads in each node and I increase the number of nodes, I see more and more speed ups. So I can utilize both the cores and the nodes. And again, like similar process for time to reach accuracy, I'm, thinking, I'm running out of time. So, uh, you know, like we compared it with the state of the art model parallelism baseline, which is called a Horoward. It's a backend of SageMaker Databricks. It's a default engine, PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, and Keras. Uh, here, is the com here is the actual problem that we started with. So these are actually small CPUs with four or 16 cores. They don't have a lot of GPU, uh, like uh, eight or 10 gigs RAM. And they are connected with less than one gigabits per second bandwidth. So a low, uh, low bandwidth, a high latency bandwidth. And we are looking at, uh, you know, these are all old generation Intel processors, like something that you will find on a uh, VMs, right? I mean, something that you will find on the wasted cloud. Uh, what we are looking at is D slide is our approach and Harvard is uh, the existing approach. We cannot even run Harvard on four cores. It's never finished. Four cores doesn't work. So we at least had to give it 16 cores to see some numbers. Now, even with 16 cores, as you can see, if there is no distributed nature, as in the number of nodes is one, it is a very respectable uh, like uh, uh, processing per epoch, which is 7,000 seconds. It's still a lot, but you can see something. The moment you go into the distributed world, the moment you shard it and the latency is low, Harvard system will just blow up, right? So look at, so we looked at Harvard system, it has an internet bandwidth of one and 100, because you, we just want to show that it's all in the network bandwidth. If you give it one gigs per second, it is 10 to the power five into two seconds. That much seconds it takes per, uh, you know, like uh, per iteration. Whereas if you give it a very higher bandwidth, that reduces by one order of magnitude. And, you know, later does not matter much because once there is a distributed communication involved, you are communicating parameters of the order of the network, that's the bottleneck. In our case, we don't have to go to 100 gigs because with, even with one gigs and even with four cores, I can get a pretty reasonable training time and it scales with the number of nodes. So I think I'll conclude here with uh, sparsity being as a solution towards sustainable AI. Sparsity should scale with, so again, like there are a lot of notions of sparsity. What I want to argue is that sparsity should scale with model size Fixed level of sparsity is only going to provide constant factor speed up. Uh, we are actively working on implementing this in softwares. Uh, we can, we routinely go 99% or more sparse and trains model with very good accuracy. Uh, here are some other reference and I'll stop with that. Thank you. So uh, the benchmark that I showed are language models. So one of the uh, one, of, one of the you know uh, we are we are working on focused and applications which are focused on NLP right now mm -hmm. because NLP use case are pretty you know uh, chatbots uh, you know building uh, you know you want AI in your uh, you know system that interacts with users right you want to understand their language speech and one of the pre prerequisite for a speech is a good language model. Okay. So what we did here is can you build like something like word to vec or product recommendation kind of benchmarks, which is refreshed every day, right? So that's that's the kind of thing we uh, we showed in the uh, in the in the numbers there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're we're interested to talk. Uh, I'm curious to, to learn.
And then here, it seems that you're using uh, compression matrix decomposition to build that relation. Could you elaborate on mo how you're building the relation between your query and the particular component for your parameter? Because there's a billion or trillion parameter available. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, great question. I didn't go into the details on that. So as I mentioned, it's similar to how you do web search. So imagine every, so what you're looking for is you have an input and a neuron, right? An activation of a neuron is an overlap or an inner product of the input and the neuron weights, which is very similar to query document overlap, right? So when you write a query, I want to look at an overlap of a query with a document. So a very similar system can be used to do that. So we index neurons instead of web pages, and instead of the query, we have inputs. I mean, I'm just trying to give an analogy. The systems are very different. It's not that I'm using a system from Google. I don't know what Google has. But we are using a similar kind of idea to get a very fast way to know, without a lot of computation, which are the right neurons for this uh, parameter. Yeah, for Google, they're using the algorithm. That is, uh, by the way, Google ranking algorithm is just an analogy. It's a very different system. If you use what their system is, it won't be efficient. It would be even slower. What we are using is what, I mean, I have worked on, like, which is adaptive sampling using hash tables. So we use like very cheap hash functions, which was like my PhD work, then we are using like uh, hash, hash functions for inner products and, and those kind of things. But I just use that as an analogy to show you why this is possible, okay? Thank you so much. All right, thank you.